We are honoured um, to have our five plenary lecturers um, join us today for a final panel discussion. And also um, uh, two people who've been uh, facilitating um, and leading uh, the, the content of these lectures, um, who I'll introduce in a moment. The panelists have been asked to give a, a brief opening statement um, uh, about the highlights that they have gleaned from this conference. And we'll ask them to, to talk with one another as well. And then we'll be opening the floor for questions. Um, you're invited to add your questions for our panelists using the Q&A feature in, in Zoom. And we'll try to answer as many as time allows. As a reminder, you can learn more about all of our speakers on the speaker page in Zoom events. Uh, so we have, uh, in the order in which they presented, Dr. Gina Zerlo, co-director of the Centre for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Also, Dr. Grace Ji Sun Kim, professor of theology at the Earlham School of Religion. Dr. Musa W. Dube, William Ragsdale Cannon Distinguished Professor of New Testament at Emory University. Dr. Elizabeth Lewis Hall, Professor of Psychology at Biola University. Dr. Patrick Reyes, Senior Director for Learning Design in the, at the Forum for Theological Exploration. Also joining the panel is my colleague, Dr. Susan Maros, who has been the main mind and organizer behind these, uh, this year's Missiology Lectures. Um, and chaired the first day that we met together. Dr. Maris is Affiliate Assistant Professor of Christian Leadership at Fuller Theological Seminary and has recently published with IVP Academic, Calling in Context, Social Location and Vocational Formation. And also working with her and me in the organization of the lectures has been Dr. Vince Bantu, Assistant Professor of Church History and Black Church Studies at Fuller, who we're also expecting to join us. So we're going to focus our discussion where we began with the theme of power, agency and women in the mission of God. So in this first part of the, this final session, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to highlight their key takeaways from this year's Missiology Lectures. What should be the understanding of this event uh, in the, uh, our, um, the way we interpret and practice the mission of God? Meanwhile, conference attendees, please do start posting your comments um, in the chat and questions to our panelists in the Q&A. So uh, this time there isn't an appointed order. Um, so I'd love to know who wants to, to kick us off um, and uh, draw attention to what they think are the highlights, which may include things that you particularly highlighted, um, but may also be things that you've heard in the discussion or from your colleagues. If nobody else is dying to go, I don't, I don't mind uh, launching Please. this. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how much this is highlight and how much it is my own kind of reflection as as it's uh, as it's wrapping up and some things that I'm left uh, thinking about. Uh, so one is uh, one prompting is is this sense that uh, you know there are so many barriers that women face uh, around us uh, internationally. It takes so many different forms, and. Uh, there is uh, kind of an increasing sense of uh, responsibility uh, that we all need to take the actions that we can in the particular context in which we find ourselves to address these barriers for the women uh, uh, around us. Uh, I, I think, as I've uh, heard a bit about uh, some of the other discussions, that probably one of the primary uh, ways that I contributed to the conference was in surfacing this idea of benevolent sexism, which I think is a a new concept for many people and uh, may add kind of a different level of uh, understanding the ways in which women are disempowered from moving forward in their own lives. Uh, so not just by hostile actions around them or overt aggression, but uh, sometimes by the very well-intentioned uh, contexts in which uh, they may even participate that end up holding women back 
and uh, uh, making them kind of buy into or internalize a sense that they are uh, weaker and less capable and less agentic than what women actually are. The other thing I've been thinking about is that um, address these these power imbalances, uh, what in psychology we talk about as sexism really matters. And I was wondering, I was not able, of course, to, to address many of them, but several of the comments were about how we should go about uh, addressing these. And I think that if we're talking about addressing sexism as part of fulfilling God's mission, then we have to do it God's way. And I think what's that are very tempting because they tap into our very human tendencies want to to vent or to hurt and punish the perpetrators. And uh, I, I just want to say very clearly, I don't think that these are legitimate options for us as followers of Christ, that if we are going to follow Christ, we have to do not only do what he would want uh, in terms of uh, freeing women up uh, to live flourishing lives and to uh, you know participate fully in God's kingdom, but we also need to do it in the way that Christ modeled for us. And that is not a wimpy way. Uh, when I think of Jesus doing things out of love, of course, we have to include things like confronting, uh, you know, the the vendors in the temple, the money changers in the temple uh, among that. I mean, I have to think that if he was characterized by love, that that also was a loving action toward those individuals. But we can never lay aside the fact that it has to be done uh, in in love. Uh, in other words, out of a concern for the well-being of the women who are affected, but also uh, of the men and women who perpetrate uh, sexism against others. So uh, I think I've taken up my time. I'll back off now and see if anybody has any strong reactions to that. That's great. Thank you for getting us started, Dr. Hall. Who'd like to go next? Oh, I'm not sure if my Wi-Fi is connected well. Well, I'm just so humbled um, to be invited for this uh, really important conference. Uh, I'm just so grateful for, for Fuller uh, because you hold so many exciting events and conferences and talks throughout the year. And to make this online, and I know people around the world have been listening um, from Wednesday. People have emailed and contacted me about where they are listening from. It's really exciting for me because it really opens up and, you know, the, the missiology that it is really this whole world and that we really need to connect with other women and empower other women. So I'm really grateful for Fuller for inviting me and such diverse voices, because when we have diverse voices coming to the table, it really, really enriches um, this conversation and it will help us to work together and be in solidarity. For me, when I think about women's oppression and how we need to be in solidarity with each other, racially diverse women, women of different orientation, of different ableism, um, different socioeconomic status, different levels of education, it always reminds me of the intersectionality of oppression. So we have to be able to understand how these different levels of oppression continue to push women down. So an example is I'm not just a woman, but I'm a woman of color, a woman, uh, a straight woman, kind of educated. And so there are these diverse ways that women continue to be oppressed. So, you know, this conference was about power, agency, empowerment. I think recognizing how we have been oppressed and how society continues to oppress, that we need to be um, helping and empowering. And as Christians and people of faith, relying on scripture, because there are enough biblical passages um, from the first testament and the second testament that really does uh, that really empowers women you know when we think about jesus's ministry it was never about keeping the status quo it was about upsetting the status quo 
He reached out to the lepers who were the outcast. He reached out to the Samaritan woman at the well. He welcomed the woman who anointed Jesus. When we think about the actual ministry of Jesus, and we are to do what Christ did, then, you know, what is there to stop us from stopping women? So we need to gain, uh, we need women to gain their agency. For me, it's been a lifelong struggle. I continue to struggle with it. That's why I'm so honored and I am so grateful for Dr. Kim and Dr. Marcos for the invitation to speak and share my uh, my perspective. There is so much work still ahead when we're thinking about missiology, when we're thinking about how we lift up women in the church, in the faith communities, and how we as a community need to be in solidarity with each other. So I'm just grateful um, for this time and for the conference and for all the women attendees. And thank you so much for translating, translating it into Korean and to Spanish. And I hope for the other um, languages that people speak, that somehow um, this can also be translated into different languages. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll hop in. Great. So. I think one of the themes that has been probably obvious to most people is that women are oppressed around the world. And hence the entire reason perhaps for a conference like this to talk about women's power and agency in the mission of God is because in so many different contexts, women are denied power and agency in the mission of God, even though in many places, women are leading in the mission of God, but they're not leading in the traditional ways that Christians have considered, that Christians consider to be leadership, right? If they're not leading an organization or leading a church or at the main decision-making table, and yet in all these different contexts, women are finding creative solutions to overcome their oppression. They're finding grassroots ways to overcome their oppression. They're finding ways in solidarity with other oppressed women to overcome um, their oppression. And so I think from my perspective, as someone who's trying to collect data on women around the world, I have been so discouraged by the chronic lack of data that's out there about women's participation in congregational life, about their participation in mission and missionary organizations, their participation in theological education. It, the, it's just, you. it's really hard to get a global perspective of women's contributions to Christianity because not enough people are paying attention to what women are doing. Or like what Dr. Kim said in her talk, women are invisible. Or in Dr. Dubé's talk, African women bear the brunt of every crisis on the continent. I mean, women are doing so much, they struggle through so much, they're constantly overlooked, and yet they're finding ways to become empowered. And I think one of the things that strikes me is how holistic women are in their approach to all this. And we've seen that theme of holism in many people's discussions. Um, I think of Dr. Dana Roberts' book, American Women in Mission, talking about the holism of women missionaries who never separated the physical from the spiritual, maybe in the way that men did. And we, we see this in women today. They don't separate gender-based violence from ecological activism. They don't separate peace-building work from evangelism. They don't separate theological education from educating girls in primary school. All of this is connected. And I think Christians in the West have so much work to do to think more holistically about what it means to be a Christian in this world. And if we can look towards women in the global South to help educate us to break these dualisms that we've been stuck in all this time. I think Dr. Kim talked about that too, the Western dualism that's hindered our ability to really like live life fully in Jesus Christ. So I, I'm discouraged on the one hand because of women's invisibility and how they're constantly overlooked in the utter lack of data. Um, but I'm also encouraged at the same time because the harder we work, the more we are uncovering these stories of women that are inspiring and empowering people to keep going 
I think that's the thing that I take from this conference and hearing all these people from different disciplinary perspectives, different, um, you know, ethnic communities, different places around the world. We have to keep going, even though we do face hostile sexism and benevolent sexism, and we do face all of these challenges, but we have to keep going. So that's something that I'm definitely going to take away from this and share with, with my students and the people in my community that, yeah, it's hard, but we can't just get stuck in the hard. We have to, we have to find inspiration from all of these other women around the world to keep going. Mm, that's great. The themes are really coming out so far. I've heard the the benevolent sexism theme, um, the uh, solidarity theme, and the dualism, um, uh, the need for gender analysis, um, and the the interconnectedness of women around the world, um, uh, and and everybody around the world actually. <laughs> but yes. So, um, who would like to go next? Please speak up trying to see you all at once. It's about time we had a voice from um, one of the, our uh, male presenters, please, or chairs. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Please. Um, just uh, a, Sharon, the deep gratitude for uh, Fuller and the panel and the lectures that have been uh, presented. It's just been a, it's been a blessing and honor to even be a part of it. Uh, my uh, remarks will be brief. I think I'm speaking directly to men who I hope are tuning into this and watching this because uh, issues that affect um, folks in our communities, um, women in our communities, is uh, we have repentance in our tradition. These are male patriarchal dominated problems. We we did this. <laughs> we have some responsibility and accountability to unmake these systems that uh, perpetuate uh, gender violence and. Um, I think one of the things that uh, really stood out to me is this tension to the interconnectedness, as um, has been said, um, not just between um, bodies, gendered bodies, but between the environment and the places we're in. Um, from my context as a Chicano, as someone who's um, paying attention to indigeneity and the way that my family travels in the world, this connection to the way that we're destroying this earth, the disappearance of women, and the lack of public mourning is heartbreaking for me and the work that I do. The Not just the invisibility, I mean, I'd be, yes, the invisibility, but there's also like a lack of, we have in our traditions a way of mourning loss. And what breaks my heart is that there is, there's not a sustained attention to the mourn loss of indigenous women who are disappearing today. Uh, there's not a mourn loss of the hummingbirds disappearing from our indigenous lands where I am. Um, that we can commit genocide on the natural world at a thousand times the rate of natural extinction. Like we're, we're destroying this planet. And the fact that there isn't a public outcry from, I'm speaking to men again, that that's not part of the leadership thing. It's These are not just problems to be solved. These are lives to be mourned, to grieve, and to spend time ritualizing that so that way they can be made visible and they can be brought into that. Um, and then just one other thing, I think, <clears throat> for me that kind of came up in our session, at least in the chat, and then a few text messages I got after, is the making and unmaking men um, and young boys and how we raise uh, young young men to be able to follow women's leadership. Um, that is clear to me. That is not something that we train boys to do, to hear the voices of women, to hear the uh, leadership of women, um, to understand their participation in women's leadership means you can still be a part of the community, listen and follow. Uh, you don't need to be in front of the room all the time. So there's something for me about the theological education of people. And for me, in our tradition, we have great examples of these moments where women led and the community followed. And I think we need to recover those as central stories, not side stories, that preaching from those moments that uh, I've said this in other of my writings, um, Jesus' stories are great. So is Mary's call story. So is Miriam's call story. So is 
folks who are on the margins. And if we can center those stories, they're in our books for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they they are good stories for us to tell and retell again. And I think, uh, especially this next generation of boys, need to hear them over and over and over again. Um, so that way, they know that their mothers, grandmothers, daughters, family members that that's that's who they should be following as well, and not just told that you're the next leader. You you're part of a leadership community. So for me, th- those are the things that really stood out to me. Is how do we Speaking to men in particular, how do we show up in these conversations to learn, listen, participate in ways that are life-giving, generative for this planet and for our communities? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Dubé, um, I was leaving you till last because I, um, you were having some difficulty getting connected, but are you able to share yourself now on these the issues that you think have been raised by this conference? Thank you so much um, for having me and thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, I think uh, for me, um, at this point of our theological journey as women of uh, spirituality, uh, seeking to find out um, and to live out our lives as God wills, um, finding uh, seeking to live out our agency as God wills us and the power that God gave us. Uh, one of the most critical questions that I think face us as theologians um, and our and theological educators and people of faith is the fa- fact of the of the earth, um, the oppression of the earth and its intersection with the oppression of women. Uh, The oppression of the earth and its intersection with the oppression of those who are already in the margins of the earth. Um, How does it intersect with poverty? Uh, How does um, earth crisis intersect with issues of race? The biggest question that I find myself struggling with is, how do I think through the earth theologically uh, as an educator and as a, the- as a theologian? And so as we reflect more about the status of women right now, I think one of the contexts that we really, really uh, confront us <clears throat> is how many people, people's homes, are destroyed by climate change, by global warming. We are witnesses of floods that come and disseminate cities and villages, stretches of land. People are right now underwater and they have no one to turn to. Their governments are not even able um, to to meet the need that has arisen, you know, and you know we can count every continent right now. So many countries going on. So the issue of centering women's oppression together with centering the S oppression and its intersectionality, intersectionality with issues of race, um, issues of class. Um, are becoming so, so pertinent that I I find myself having to ask myself if my theological paradigms are speaking to the context. And so I was very, very grateful uh, that we could meet again now globally as women from very different contexts to think again about how do we think theologically about salvation? What, what is salvation now? Um, where the earth, you know, our home, all of us, wherever we are, regardless of you know, our continents, our class, our gender, is increasingly showing severe signs of distress in a lot of people, you know crisis are even compounded. What is salvation? How should I imagine 
salvation. I feel like we are at that point that we need to rethink most of our theological paradigms or take them to another level. What should be repentance? You know, um, you know, how should we think of repentance and who should be repenting and how should, where should repentance take us? I feel that we need to be thinking more about what does it mean to be church, to be a people of God gathered in the presence of God and seeking to understand God's will for us and for the, for the world or the earth as a whole. And thus it brings us to the big, big question of what is mission? What is God's mission? Which I believe was one of the key themes of, um, of uh, this conference. You know, we gathered to think about agency power and, and mission uh, of God. And this is so important that we again reflect on what does it mean to have power and how do we use power? You know, and how should we be using power? How have we used power in the past and how should we use it uh, in this context of, of the earth and, and of the earth being facing serious crisis and women being again um, finding themselves more oppressed as their fields are destroyed, their homes are destroyed, as their livelihood are destroyed, where everything they have worked for and known is destroyed, and they have no one to tend to, save to call on God. So um, what should be mission? How should we understand the mission of God? I think this is an important thing um, that we gathered here um, to reflect uh, the, you know, on the status of women. And I think we really, really need to centralize the earth um, and women in the earth and their communities in the earth and to think about who is God for us in this crisis. So um, this for me are, are really questions that I'm, I'm beginning to journey with. And as I said, uh, together with the circle, since 2019, we have uh, adopted this theme of Mother Earth, Mother Africa, and religion. You know, and we have been struggling with how do we think theologically through the earth, with the earth, and in the earth, as we articulate our faith in contexts where we find that our situations are compounded you know, by the environmental crisis. Uh, we all just uh, have been coming out of COVID-19 or we are still coming out of it. But for the cycle of concerned African women theologians in the African continent, we had just been or still coming out of HIV AIDS pandemic and only to be thrown again into the other end, you know, by a pandemic that put women in the center and compounded their issues of uh, uh, marginalization in various communi communities. And we realize that these pandemics are not divorced or separate from uh, the earth crisis. And now as various places, countries and continents experience changing climates, whether it's heat waves or, you know, amazing floods and, and hurricanes and storms that fill up people's places with water. Again, there will be other pandemics. So, um, so recentering the earth, uh, the woman's body with the earth, and recentering God in the earth, um, as we think theologically about what is God's mission, is for me a question that I think um, I'm struggling with, and I'm glad we gathered here to think about God's mission. I think we need to continue thinking about that question. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for highlighting um, this, the main theme of the conference here. Um, 
And if we could come out with an answer to that question by the end of this discussion, that would be great. So um, Dr. Maros, you, you were the key person who brought all these people together. Um, how do you, um, uh, what do you think about the highlights that have come out of the conference? And are you any further towards an answer to the question of, uh, of power agency and women in the mission of God? Well, like like all academic conversations, right? If we're we um, we've we've offered some definitions, we've given some paradigms, we've offered contexts of of different academic disciplines. You know, whether it's in the social sciences, it's in theology, it's it's in practical theology. Um, we've offered stories from these different contexts, which I think is so important. You know, and I find myself reflecting as we're we're coming to the end here and listening once again to to each of our uh, plenary speakers. Um, I find myself reflecting again on the end of the Book of Revelation. You know, where in uh, the the great city, um, the presence of God among the people is all the nations. The wealth of all the nations comes into the city, and um, that's not the GDP. That is the riches. Of all the people, right? Of every nation, tribe, and tongue, every people, um, that there's something distinctive. And so, in in our disciplines, I think we reflect the wisdom of God in various ways in our disciplines. That is important to hear Dr. Zerlo's uh, sociological research. It's important to hear Dr. Hall's psychological research. And and as I believe Dr. Hall made the comment, you know, that sometimes when we're confronting uh, trying to help change happen, it, it can be helpful to say, well, this is what the research shows, right? Give us, what are the data? What are the data is, is a helpful question. Um, Dr. Dubé's wonderful uh, exemplar of the Circle of Concerned African Women Theologians, you know, to say, these are these are women. Um, Mercy Adoyoye took initiative to gather women to be theologians together. Um, I appreciate Dr. Kim's uh, emphasis on invisibility and the and the cost that 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 is. And so these are both are true. Women are both invisible and powerful when we gather together collectively. Um, and and Dr. Reyes is. Um, engaging in the lived out theology, uh, the, the, the theology of his daughter and the, the wild child and the invitation uh, to us as, as to be wild, wild women uh, with our brothers who are working out their humanity. Um, so these diversities, these embodied embedded places of distinctiveness of our, of our context are, are, are so valuable and so important that is a foretaste of that, the riches and the wealth of the nations. Um, and and it, as we listen to each other, um, we we have a foretaste of that. You know, we we I hear something, I see something that I couldn't see from my lived experience uh, when I listen to my my brother and my sisters. Uh, that that helps us press into what does it look like to live out um, God's shalom. Um, together. Uh, what does it look like to press into that? So just so, so delighted and grateful for, for your partnership, Dr. Kim, and your partnership, uh, Dr. Bantu, and for the collection of, of all of the people who have participated in contributing to our wisdom and um, understanding and development as a community. Mm -hmm. Right. And you mentioned in the chat that all this is going to come together in a book as well. Um, and uh, it will also, the plenary lectures will also be on Fuller Studio. So um, we can disseminate <laughs> um, our learning um, together, which is great. Um, Dr. Bantu, um, can we hear from your perspective on um, these questions? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Long as long as I ain't last, though. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's uh, uh, man, it's, it's, it's humbling just to be a brother in the midst of all these strong sisters uh, leading. And uh, man, I've just been sitting at, at their feet, uh, just learning so much. And um, 
I just appreciate everything that's been said. And, um, you know, kind of like my brother Patrick was saying, uh, you know, I, man, I just want to really uh, be a, a good ally. Um, I feel like we have, you know, so much. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, of course, I got to come at it from a church history standpoint, but I just feel like we have so much of a pedigree, uh, you know, in the church. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of negative things and there's a lot of patriarchy today and historically, but there's also a lot of, of resources to draw upon and emulate from. You know, I think of like, uh, you know, sisters like St. Rip Sima, uh, who straight up like threw bows with the king of Armenia when he was trying to, uh, you know, like trying to um, oppress her and violate her. And she straight, the text says that she like straight whooped his behind and, 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 you know, uh, and, and then, and then later evangelized and brought people to Christ. And, uh, and then, you know, we have people like, uh well lots of patros you know who resisted the uh colonial attempted colonialism in africa um even like stood up you know when her husband her own husband and her king and uh and the portuguese forces were trying to stop and trying to uh you know really impose uh colonialism that this this african woman which by the way is one of the first uh sub-saharan african women in the history of the world to have their own biography um you know actually led a resistance movement with men and women uh you know resisting european colonialism and resisting kind of this top-down ethiopian male patriarchal system and so i mean there's a pedigree of, of strong sisters in the in the history of the church and i just want to see more of this really coming out but also i mean i just like i said as a brother just trying to be a good ally like i think about people like um uh, you know, even the text that we have of, uh, of, of biographies like Lot de Petros uh, or St. Ripsima, a lot of them sometimes were were written by men. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, issues and complications of that that we have to get, we, we continually have to get over in terms of empowering women authorship. Um, but, but in one sense, I guess I'd like to think of it as a way of like, I just think about, you know, in the 17th century Ethiopia of being a man uh, who is using their their platform to write this story about this woman who literally led a, a, a freedom resistance movement uh, and 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 be and using their voice in order to to uplift the voices and center the voices and experiences of women. And I I love the comments that have been said even about the intersectionality of of everything and uh, uplifting the voices of women, but also uh, looking at issues of race, looking at issues of ecology and uh, issues of class. I was I was really glad that Dr. Dubé uh, mentioned that, especially really lifting up and, and empowering uh, the voices of of women, but also especially dark skinned women. Women, uh, and also especially uh, women who are coming from under-resourced communities. And so, um, and so, yeah, just, uh, you know, um, really just, you know, uh, hoping that I can continue to learn how to like this man whose name is Galau Dewos in the 17th century, how, uh, how we can use, you know, whatever platform to really center the, the voices of women, of, of dark-skinned women, of women from low-income communities, um, and really encouraging the church, uh, all of the church, to follow that leadership. Uh, and I feel like this conference has been a great example of exactly that. Uh, and it's, again, it's just been an honor to sit at the feet of all of these uh, great scholars and, and, um, and, and just learn from you all. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. And I hope that's going to go in the book as well, um, <laughs> even though you weren't a plenary speaker. Um, so so where does this um, this bring us to? I, I, mean, I think this theme of interconnectedness really helps me to understand why mission can't just stop at um, uh, telling the message of, of Jesus kind of verbally or proclamation that the interconnectedness is what kind of leads us on to um to do all sorts of other things as well because we can't change one thing without another <laughs> um and the global interconnectedness has been characteristic of christianity since its very beginnings as dr bantu knows um knows very well um but also the set the the sense of belonging to the earth and um uh in the just in the Holy Communion, the the bread and the wine, and you know, coming we, that we partake of, um, being symbols of of the fruit of the earth um, that sustains us, and we do that so often, and yet um, we <laughs> we fail to put it into practice. So um, there's a question in the chat about uh, from a, a practitioner who says she continually hears the lament that people need to be told what to um, need to be told what how to do to right the wrongs we've been discussing um but how do we get from 
telling people this <laughs> to actually bringing about meaningful change um, that that uh, transforms broken systems. Um, uh, have we got some some concrete things that um, that to suggest that need to be done as a result of this, and perhaps in the organisations or churches that we belong to? Uh, in Fuller, perhaps, um, um, are there things, uh, concrete things that we want to propose? How would you I answer that? The, I, I think ahead. the lament is so important. I think we begin with lament. Um, one of my co-books that I co-wrote with Graham Joseph, no, yeah, Graham Joseph Hill, Healing Our Broken Humanity, we begin with lament because so many times Christians have overlooked lamenting. In the Old Testament, you know, the Book of Lamentations, people were aware of lament. But even on a Sunday morning, we don't have this practice of lamenting. So I'm actually grateful for the person who submitted that question, that once we begin with lament, we're recognizing that we can cry out to God and asking God to help us in our brokenness. So I think uh, I was so grateful for every speaker, uh, the keynote speakers, and then this um, panel describing of you know how there are so many problems, but if we begin with lament and we cry out to God, then we can try to work towards these um, problems that are blocking us. So the aspect of invisibility of particularly Asian American women, how can we overcome this? So that in as we look at this invisibility as a spiritual issue, that we can really work towards making people visible. And I think understanding the interconnectedness. So Dr. Uh, Dubé was talking about crying for the earth. I think understanding that, you know, she actually used Mother Earth and um, Mother Africa. I, I actually welcome those, but also be a bit cautious when we feminize the earth. Because once we feminize the earth, it is easy for us to then dominate over the earth because traditionally that's what men did to women, dominated over women, uh, oppressed women, subjugated women, and raped women. So in that same manner, if we kind of feminize the earth, you know, there is a positive aspect, but the negative is then we dominate, we rape, we take what we want and throw it away. So I just have a little caution, but understanding the intersectionality of all this, the oppression of women, and when we see the devastation of climate change, you know, that affects, when we look globally, the most oppressed from this climate change that is happening are the women of color. You know, and then there's a whole cycle of oppression because then their children are affected. And that's when we get into human trafficking, sex trafficking, you know, this countless, it just spirals and spirals and spirals. So the we who live in the rich countries really need to do something about it and understanding the intersectionality um, of this. But I think beginning with lament is so important because then it becomes a launch pad for us to really move into action. So there are many, many things, especially if women can get together, we can turn the world upside down and, and, and engage in the work of God. And around the world, we are seeing this, women communities coming together. And even in my panel with um, Dr. Alexia talking about base communities and how women are getting together and really changing how society is. And if we can work together, actually, we can fight, fight this climate change that's happening. Next week is COP27, and I've been working with the Council of World Council of Churches. So I will be attending that meeting. And I've attended many of those, but I think we all, the church really needs to get our act together and um, fight the climate change that's happening. So thank you for all the panelists. Mm. Dr. Dubey, did you want to respond at all to that? We heard your lament earlier. Thank you. Um, yes, um, what are the things we can do um, to actually become part 
um, to assume agency uh, that brings uh, positive change. Um, I just want to speak from the circle of concerned African, I mean, Af African uh, women in the circle. Um, during the HIV AIDS um, pandemic, we worked with faith communities to equip faith communities to um, have a theology that empowers them to respond positively uh, in terms of issues of prevention, issues of caregiving, issues of access to um, you know, medication, and also to empower them to understand the structures of oppression behind uh, the spread of HIV. Um, so we, our intervention there in trying to bring change was to work very closely with uh, communities of faith um, to, to give them a theology that uh, you know, gives them uh, ownership and also in owning the issue to also feel, uh, to actualize their agency mm -hmm. by going out and acting and becoming um, uh, forces of positive change in the community. When we launched the uh, theme of Mother Earth and Mother, Mother Africa, what we really wanted to, um, to highlight there is how gendered gender in, its, in both cases facilitates the oppression of both the women and the Earth. Um, the Earth has been regarded as Mother, Mother Earth and has been regarded as um, female, uh, because of course, yes, it um, gives birth to trees, to everything that we have. So in many ways, uh, it's very often the earth is regarded as female. But in being regarded as female, what has happened to the earth, you know? So we are utilizing that paradigm to be able to own up to what has happened in the past and what has been the implications and the impact of being gendered, both the women and the earth. Uh, it was really when we launched the, the theme in uh, 2019, because we want to shift theological thinking uh, away from centering human beings way too much, you know, um, you know and to think uh, through, think theologically through the earth and with the earth as part and parcel of the earth, as people who are interconnected with the earth, not above or below. Um, so it was in our intention once more to produce uh, manuals of training of trainers so that we can work with faith leaders, uh, communities of faith, churches and, and other faith communities to train them on a theologies of loving Mother Earth of living with Mother and Earth in peace, uh, and of re repenting yes from all the damages that we have done, but uh, unbeknown to us, then COVID was going to strike, um, and when it's, it it did, you know, uh, the being locked out and locked away meant that. There was no not much interaction. So unlike in the HIV AIDS context, we are yet to, to start the process of developing manuals. We don't only want to write books focusing on uh, Mother Earth, Mother Africa, and, um, and faith. Um, we also want to continue working with um, communities of faith because the communities of faith are based in, in the in the communities and they speak with the communities. So if, for example, you know, how do people preach in a way that is earth friendly? How do people preach um, or pray with and through the earth? How does our lament, how can we use our lament to highlight what has happened to the earth, what is happening to the earth, how it impacts women and their communities and all their resources? You know, when we lament, we highlight an issue, but we are not just highlighting an issue. We are also calling for change. So lament is, you know, always calling for a better future, um, you know, um, for, for repentance uh, to another level of salvation. So yes, at this moment, um, 
of our theological journey with uh, with women and the F in the circle of concerned African women. Uh, women. We, we were just coming out of COVID and it was in our plans to develop training of trainers manuals, to develop things like handbooks on sermons and notes on preaching from F and gender sensitive sermons. So that's another agenda that we are yet to partake. And I'm grateful that uh, after yesterday's um, presentation uh, during this conference, some publishers have approached me to to inform me that they they will be happy to travel with us in some of these uh, you know ways in which we want to undertake to bring some change. Thank you so much. That's really um, a practical and um, a way forward for us, um, Dr. Hall. I see you leaning in. <laughs> um, would Would you like to add anything to to that or comment? I think I was very uh, taken with the concept of lament. It's actually something that uh, kind of separate from my gender work, I, I've been doing some some work in lately. And so to have these uh, kind of these di ideas intersect and uh, I, the, the concept of lament came up as you were asking for kind of specific recommendations of how to move forward uh, towards, uh, you know, making things better for women. And my first reaction was like, well, it, that that's not really i'm not sure how lament fits uh with being action oriented toward addressing the issue and then uh as dr kim was talking uh, uh, about it i i started thinking more and more about what i knew about lament and i thought actually that sounds like a really fantastic starting point uh it accomplishes so much uh i mean shouldn't our the first thing that we do with the pain and the suffering of the world be to offer it to god and to express it to the one who ultimately is uh, uh, capable of uh, making all things new and, and uh, affecting the change that needs to happen. And so uh, I, I, I was thinking about it from that perspective. And then, of course, so many other benefits that come from it. Uh, so many of the Psalms of Lament were intended for uh, community expression they weren't individual prayers, they were community prayers. And the power of raising awareness of issues as we lament together for certain issues, and also helping our sisters locally and around the world feel uh, feel understood and joined with uh, as we lament with them. I mean, I, I start to see all kinds of possibilities in terms of lament as a very powerful way of working towards uh, improving the lives of women. So those are some of the things that I was uh, sitting here thinking about as we were um, trying to get very practical here with respect to outcomes. Mm. Thank you. Can I just uh, add? Yes, please. Yeah. So I think uh, I'm so grateful for uh, what you just shared. Uh, that was so helpful. So I think the aspect when we are lamenting and we're crying out to God, uh, my other aspect, you know, my a lot of my work is on pneumatology, so on the Holy Spirit. And I think in the church, we always cry out, come, Spirit, come. When we're crying out to God in lament, we're offering ourselves and crying out because of all the wrong things that are happening, the climate injustice, gender injustice, racial injustice, economic injustice. And as we lament, we are really crying out to God to come fill us. And I really believe we cannot do this work of justice, this work of mission, empowerment, um, offering agency to those who are so disempowered, unless the Spirit of God is within us. So I think for those who are looking for practical, if we begin at lament, I think it will ultimately lead us into doing the action because when the Spirit comes to us, we cannot just sit back and say, okay, that's it. I lamented. That's all I can do. It, the Spirit really fills us up to do the work of God, you know, around the globe. You know, I know there are listeners from around the world right now. And so for the women that feel disempowered, have no agency, feeling invisible in their community, in the church, in society, 
that really the Spirit of God will come within us, among us, and really empower us to make change. And I think one of the greatest social justice issues is the climate change. It's affecting everybody, and it will continue to affect until we do something. And so I'm hoping that we will find the agency and the empowerment and be in solidarity and understand the intersectionality of these and really work for justice. Mm -hmm. I also heard in there um, from um, Dr. Ray is the, the repentance side as well, um, and perhaps not only from the side of men, but, um, but especially I don't know if you want to say any more about that, Dr. Reyes. I mean, one of the things I'm, I would love to pick up on this lament is from where you're doing the lament in community. It reminds me of my work um, in California, working with uh, Field Working Poor and the lament coming from the, the labor in the fields, um, the violence against women that happens in the field, literally. I mean, as the pandemic raged on, folks had to go and work poverty level wages and women were not just marginalized because of the economic systems and oppression, but the other men in the fields, the violence that happened against their bodies and thinking about what does it mean to call out lament from that place where we are breaking down the earth underneath our hands. And when I say us, it's those folks who are working the fields and the rest of us got to order our food to our doorstep so we could survive the pandemic or those in the U.S. context who have privilege. And, and so for me, lament is located. It's embodied in a place. It's not just on Sunday. It's embodied in the everyday realities of people. And yeah, I, I mean, I'm really caught by this, um, where lament comes from, who it comes from. And in my work, um, because I feel I am fortunate, I get to work with the next generation of Christian leaders. Having to recover those things, as Dr. Bantu said, from our traditions that are no longer there where folks are not breaking the earth underneath their hands anymore, or they're not working in those fields, when they're not seeing those violences that happen against women in the fields and trying to bring awareness and bring it to the surface. So it's not just a lament because as an organizer, there's work to be done. There's justice to be done because that should never happen. There's education to happen with poor marginalized men in the fields that that's not okay that the violence is happening there, that there is layers of oppression that are happening constant. And so, yeah, for me, I'm just, I'm really, I'm this, this question of lament and how do we turn it into action? It's for me, at least, uh, it's, it's seeing where that lament comes from or whose bodies it comes from and uh, lamenting with the earth. As Dr. Dubé said, I mean, this is, we no longer on mass kind of break the earth beneath our hands. And so we're breaking the earth completely because um, mm -hmm. we're not feeding ourselves in the same way that we used to. So for me, this is a lament in the change in the world and how we're moving. And absolutely a repentance for those of us who have power and privilege, especially men who have power and privilege to name and do differently, to call a different world and to unmake unjust systems and you know finish the our active participation in the violence against women in particular and this earth because those things are related from my context for those women who work in the fields absolutely i'm finding this really helpful because um as a missiologist um i I've, I've been struggling to understand that all that i've heard at fuller about lament and since i got here it seems to be a really major theme and i'm not sure that i've really understood it till now um or or did, or or found how lament can move on to actual uh, actually doing something to to change matters or can be part of i mean maybe the two just go go hand in hand um so this is a really helpful conversation um somebody else wanted to come in um dr hall yes yeah, I'm wondering if I can riff off of uh, our, our our two previous speakers here uh, with a few more thoughts about lament. Uh, as Dr. Kim brought in the concept of the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, I fleshed to that wonderful verse in Romans 8 that talks about the Holy Spirit groaning when we don't know what to pray for and uh, how relevant that is to the concept of lament. And, you know, I am not a theologian, I'm a psychologist, but uh, as I've read some commentaries about those, uh, about that particular verse, there's some indication that it's it's not just that the Holy Spirit is putting into words what we 
might if we knew what to say, but there's also a sense in which the Holy Spirit is shaping our hearts through that groaning in accordance with God's will. So uh, when I think uh, then about the, the empowering function of lament, how to get from lament to action, it strikes me that, again, it's one more way in which lament is important because it offers up our hearts uh, to the Holy Spirit's work in shaping us to know what kind of form or shape that that action should take. And so once again, it becomes a very, uh, all of a sudden it's emerging as a, perhaps a very important part of uh, of the laboring, as we have been putting it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and to continue that, I, Dr. Kim, I just wanted to mention Dr. Amos Young is there at Fuller yes. and he has that book on lament. So I'm sure you're being really exposed. <laughs> I'm sure it's coming from all these angles. Yes. <laughs>